Hi everybody. Hi. I'm Brian. Talk of the presentation thing about motors and motor controllers. Start off with how I got interested in this stuff is um, I've designed a couple motor controllers over the last couple of years. This up here is our pistol grip controller at 971 used to drive our robot last year. It has two motors for centering the uh, steering wheel and the throttle and no springs. So it's all the motors used to center it. That down there is the board that me and a couple of students worked on to uh, control it. This over here is a picture of a wood box. It's an electric go-kart that me and some other 971 mentors made. And we wanted it to go faster, so we made our own motor controller for it. So that's what this is. That's a big motor controller. That was very exciting to get working. Uh, so I was a student on 971 for four years, and now I've been a mentor for four years. Um, and yeah, I got started making circuit boards when I was a student, and I've graduated to more exciting circuit boards. Start off with, what is a motor? Basically, a motor is a thing that converts electrical power to mechanical power. And because everything is reversible, because most physics things are, except for time, uh, a motor and a generator are the same thing. Basically, you convert between electrical and mechanical power. The thing that distinguishes um, a motor from like a solenoid is motors typically something that's designed to move continuously. Uh, basically you have two magnetic fields and is, if you have two magnetic fields that aren't lined up then you get a force trying to line them up. In a motor you do that rotationally so you usually call the rotating part the rotor and the stationary part the stator. Fairly straightforward names if you think about it and somehow you have to keep them rotationally separated so you can continually produce torque as your motor rotates. Um, some examples of this. This here is a sim I've taken apart. This is a stator. This is the rotor. We'll get to how these are made in a little bit. Um, when you're making a motor, at least one of your magnetic fields has to be produced from an electromagnetic coil. Because if you have two permanent magnets, once they rotate, they're going to be lined up and then you can't do anything else with it so it doesn't keep rotating. Uh, motors that people use for all kinds of crazy things are a huge variety of different choices to make. Uh, you can use permanent magnets on one side of it, which typically makes it simpler, so you don't have two sets of electrical coils you got to deal with. Uh, if you do have two coils, you can connect them in series or in parallel, or you can control them completely separately. There's also, if you have coils on the rotating part, the rotor, then you have to somehow figure out how to power them, which there's various schemes to do it. And then there's also various choices in how you commutate, which is where you switch one of the sets of fields continuously so that the motor keeps rotating. Also, some basics for electricity to help with understanding the rest of the stuff here. Um, concepts we're going to cover at the start here are voltage, current, resistance, and power, which, when I'm thinking about them, I typically make an analogy to water flowing in pipes. It's an analogy, so you can't take it too far, but uh, it gets you pretty far in thinking about basic electrical stuff. This is magical water that has no mass. It doesn't have turbulence. It always stays in the pipes and doesn't do all kinds of other things that actual water would. But basic idea is uh, voltage is like the pressure of the water in the pipes. So if you have some water higher up and some water lower down, the water lower down is going to be at higher pressure, which is actually lower voltage because it's lower down. So the, the water up high has more potential energy. Um, or if you have water in flat pipes and water with higher pressure, it wants to flow to where there's lower pressure. It's also what voltage does to electrons, kind of. Um, current for electricity is like the velocity of the water in the pipes, which is also where you get Ohm's law. One of the things people like to say about electricity, even if they don't know what it means all the time. Uh, Ohm's law is basically V equals I times R. Voltage equals current times resistance which for the water, it's like the pressure difference is the velocity times how much resistance to the flow of the water there is. Uh, resistance for electricity is a lot like resistance to flow of the water, where you have a small aperture in your pipe that it's hard for water to flow through. Um, and just like all pipes are going to restrict the flow to some extent, no matter how big they are, all wires have some resistance. Power is then energy moved uh, per time. So energy is like you have a bunch of water up high, has a bunch of potential energy. Power is how much of that you move, how quickly. And it's kind of the same thing for electricity, which you can calculate power as either current times voltage or current squared times resistance. 
which if you look at Ohm's law, those are basically saying the same thing. Now to get into an actual motor, which is a brush permanent magnet motor. These are your basic kind of motors, like we use them in FRC for everything, well, almost everything. Um, they're in the past, they were by far the most common kind of motor in low power applications because they're really simple to control. Basically, the way your uh, brush motor works is you have stator over here, which has two big permanent magnets inside of it. That's the stator, stays stationary. And then this part here is the rotor, which has some coils in it. And as it spin when you apply DC voltage, it spins. And then you have these things called the brushes to change which of the coils are energized. This animation over here, the stator stationary part, the big red and blue things that aren't changing color, and then you have one coil inside. And as you can see over here, there's these two things that are red and blue. Those are your positive and negative voltages. Those are called the brushes. They make contact with these little things on a ring here. And as it spins, once it passes 90 degrees, it changes which way the coil is energized so then it wants to keep spinning. I have some motors over here to demonstrate this a little bit better that I can pass around. But this here, the sim, so we have the rotor. This back here is called the commutation ring. It's where these things over here called the brushes make contact. When you put this thing together, so when you get it together, the brushes are on that commutation ring and they slide as it spins. And then they're basically changing which coils are energized. And if people want to take a look, I have a couple various motors to pass around. They have magnets in them, so don't pinch your fingers. Um, and then over here, I have another one if you want to take a look. You see there's these copper coils in the rotor, and then it has a little ring on the back. And then the back side of those are these two things with the brushes on them. You want to look at those too. Um, and if you look at that rotor and those motors, they have way more than just this one coil on there. Because with one coil, you have two spots in the rotation where it can get stuck, which is pretty unhelpful for a motor. And if, even if you have like three, you still, it's pretty bumpy with how much torque it's going to produce at various positions. So like the sim has a whole bunch of coils, which, um, and then over here I have cross sections through some rotors of some random motor, which um, you can see basically this here is uh, laminated steel or iron. Um, and then it's got a bunch of wires wrapped through it to make coils at varying rotational positions. Now to talk about motor controllers. Basic idea with a motor controller is you have to control the electricity going through the motor. The motor controller for a brushed motor or like a three-phase motor or a brushless motor, like you commonly get an RC hobby kind of stuff, um, and they're slowly working their way towards introducing into FRC. Uh, also, inverters, I don't know if any of you have seen one of those, like you plug it into a robot battery and you get 120 volts AC for charging a laptop or whatever off of it. Uh, also, DC mains power supplies, like the power supply for that laptop that takes AC or alternating current coming in and gives you DC out. Or also DC-DC voltage converters. Um, those are all basically the same piece of electronics that are used to control them. Uh, over here is a three-phase motor controller. This is a brush motor controller, and this is like a DC-DC converter. And if you look at them, there's the green circled part and the red circled part. That's the same for all of them. So the green circled thing is called a half bridge, which basically you have your battery is hooked up to here and there for your brush motor controller. And then this half bridge can connect each side of the motor either to power or to ground. So you have your two wires coming out of your motor. And you can hook them up like this to the battery and the motor will spin one way. Or you hook them up like this and it'll spin the other way. Or you can switch back and forth and make it spin less, uh, with less force at any given speed. For getting into a bit more details on that, we have a couple more electrical concepts to talk about. Uh, capacitance is uh, resistance to a change in voltage. So with water in the pipes, it's like the pressure. 
So a capacitor basically uh, tries to keep the same amount of pressure even when you move water in and out of it. Uh, batteries are basically a really big capacitor where you can draw quite a bit of current out of them and the voltage doesn't change much at all. Uh, for the water analogy, it's like a flexible diaphragm in your pipe, um, which you know you can see when you push water in one side, the diaphragm stretches, and then you don't get as much of a pressure buildup as you would if it was a rigid pipe you were doing that with. Uh, another way to think of a capacitor is if you try to change the voltage across it, the capacitor will force a change in the current running through it to oppose your change in voltage. An inductor is a their inductance is resistance to a change in current, which for electrical stuff, that's basically a big coil of wire, um, which you see in a motor. We got some big coils of wire here, or like a solenoid or an electromagnet. You also have big coils of wire, which have a lot of inductance. Uh, with the water analogy, it's like a big heavy paddle wheel, where if I'm moving water through it and I try and change the rate at which I'm moving the water through it, it's going to change the pressure or the voltage to oppose that change in current, uh, which if you look at them both, they're kind of like opposites of each other in some ways, and that, that actually physically is sort of how it works. Um, a capacitor has an electrical field that you charge up, or an inductor has a magnetic field you charge up, and so many things about them are either the same or opposite. Um, Although in practical circuits, you would typically see many more capacitors than inductors because making capacitors is easier. Although, as we'll get to in a minute, sometimes you do need an inductor also. Some electrical components here. Uh, start off with anything you have electricity flowing through is going to have resistance, capacitance, and inductance. When you have something you call a resistor, that means it mostly just has resistance and only has a little bit of capacitance and inductance, but there is still some. Uh, those other components that you kind of get, whether you want them or not, with every single component you have are called parasitics. And oftentimes they don't matter, but when you start getting into motor controllers, they do start to matter. Um, if you have an inductor, it's basically just a coil of wire. Uh, you can package your coil of wire into various fun shapes and form factors and stuff, but it's just a coil of wire around some ferrite sometimes. Uh, a capacitor is parallel plates that you're holding close together. So in you know, physics class or whatever, sometimes you can make a capacitor. Just you take two conductive things and hold them really close together, and it will have capacitance. When you have actual capacitors in your circuit, there's a bunch of different materials you can use and a bunch of different creative ways to try and pack them into a small volume, but it doesn't change that it's fundamentally just two conductive plates that are really close together. Uh, diode uh, lets current flow in one direction but not the other, which uh, is kind of like a check valve if you have your water analogy, where water it lets water flow pretty much freely in one direction, but in the other direction it completely blocks the flow. These things over here are the symbols for them. Uh, that's a diode down there, that's a capacitor, that's an inductor. Um, yeah, uh, with a diode you do have some resistance to the flow in the direction it lets it flow, but it's, uh, it's typically a constant voltage drop. There's a constant difference in pressure across it basically which I don't have a great analogy for that with water flowing in pipes because it's not a perfect analogy, but basically how diodes work. Um, a MOSFET, metal oxide field effect semiconductor, uh, is a uh, or transistor. Uh, it acts either like a diode or a resistor, which means you can use it like a switch to turn things on and off, right? Like the light switch over there, physical switch, you're actually physically moving things to connect them to one place or the other. Versus with a MOSFET, it's a, called a solid state device. So it means it has no moving parts. It's purely electrical, which means you can switch it on and off way faster than you could with a mechanical switch. Um, although typically in most applications it acts pretty much the same, where it's either on or off. Although the fact that when it's off, it's not actually off, it's like a diode, will come into play in a little bit. More detail about half bridges. 
which are these things here, where you have two MOSFETs and an inductor. Um, this down here is that diagram in the brush motor controller again. Uh, basically, you call the wires of the motor phases. Um, brush motor has two phases. Brushless motors typically have three, although you can do even more than that if you want to. Uh, at any point in time, your motor controller connects each one to either the high or the low side of the battery, pretty much, uh, which means you can spin one direction or the other or somewhere in between. Uh, but when you're switching this on and off, so if I turn these two on, right, the motor will spin one direction. If I turn those off and turn these two on, it'll spin the other direction. But, and when I turn these two on, right, the current through that motor doesn't increase all that fast because it's a big inductor, big coil of wire. The current through it doesn't change very quickly. So right as I turn these on, like the instant after I turn them on, nothing's really happening. It takes time, you know, microseconds, which is pretty fast, but it's still not nothing. Versus if I turn these two on ever for even a little bit, there's no inductor between those. So it just gives you a whole bunch of current flowing really fast. And that makes things hot, and then when they get hot, the magic smoke comes out, and then they don't work anymore. So you really want to avoid ever having those both on at the same time, which means you use this thing called dead time, where basically you have them both turned off for some period of time. But that creates all kinds of other exciting stuff, which get to over here. So when you're turning these two MOSFETs on and off, right? If you look at the symbol of this MOSFET, it has that diode in there. That's to remind you that when it's off, it's actually acting like a diode. That's called the body diode. Um, this here is kind of the process of switching one off and the other on. So start with, we have the high side MOSFET on. So right, this side of the motor is connected to our battery. So this terminal over here, the MOSFET has three connections to stuff. There's the source, the drain, and the gate. The source and drain are where most of the current flows through, and the gate over here is what you use to turn it on and off. So when we start with, that gate is driven high, so that MOSFET's on, so the current's flowing through there, everything's happy. Everything can stay like that for a while, all works just fine. However, once we turn that, start turning that gate off, now there's less current, like we uh, start increasing the resistance of that MOSFET basically. So V equals IR, so this inductor is going to keep drawing the same amount of current, so the voltage across that's going to increase. Eventually, that voltage is going to, the inductor wants to keep drawing current, and eventually this voltage here is going to go down low enough that it starts drawing current through the body diode of the bottom side MOSFET. Now, once this is happening, there's something kind of weird going on that you usually don't see in an electrical circuit. This here, the voltage is below the voltage of ground. Usually ground is zero volts and you keep everything above that. All the voltages are positive numbers. But because that inductor wants to keep drawing current and we're not letting it do it through the high side MOSFET, it starts going through the body diode of that bottom MOSFET, which means it has to be at a voltage lower than ground because that's the way the current's going to flow through the MOSFET. Um, once we get the high side MOSFET fully turned off, and then you typically have to wait a little because you can't actually get the timing perfect with electrical stuff, because changes in temperature and things affect all this. Then you start turning the bottom one on. So as you start doing that, the current starts flowing through the resistance of that bottom MOSFET instead of its body diode. And then you keep increasing the voltage on that gate. And then eventually you have it all the way turned on. And now the low side is fully turned on and everything's happy again. Typically in your motor controller, you want to do this as fast as possible. Because the power dissipated in that MOSFET is the current through it times the voltage across it which when we're at either of these two end states, there's a very low voltage across the MOSFET. So even if there's a bunch of current flowing, you aren't making very much heat. But in the middle here, you have large currents and large voltages. So you're making a bunch of heat in the MOSFETs, which both makes stuff inefficient and also you have to get rid of the heat somehow or stuff melts and then it doesn't work anymore. Uh, to turn from the low side back to the high side, you basically follow those steps in reverse and um, yeah. Talking a little bit more about motors before we get into how the motor controller controls it. Um, flux linkage is the, one way to phrase it is the integral of the amount of force exerted per unit of current. Uh, force between a coil and a magnet basically. 
Um, another way to think about it is when you run electricity through the coil, it makes a magnetic field. Your magnet also has a magnetic field. And the flux linkage is how much of the magnetic flux, which is fancy name for the magnetic field that actually does magnet stuff. Uh, it's how much of that flux goes through both the coil and the magnet. Uh, which sometimes physics, like online tutorials I've discovered, like talk about magnetic field lines. Um, that's basically a way of visualizing magnetic field. Magnetic field is kind of a constant thing like air or air pressure. It doesn't change in discrete increments usually. Uh, and flux linkage is how much of that goes from the magnet goes through how many turns of the coil. So if you're looking at your rotor here, you have like a, have like a coil going from here around here. And then you have your magnets over here. And when you stick it in the motor, you have however much of the, magnet, of the magnetic field from the, perm, the stator is going through each of the coils on the rotor. And this flux linkage is, um, if you spin a motor, you get a voltage across it called the back EMF voltage. Flux linkage is proportional to that voltage, um, which it's also proportional to how much torque you will get from putting current through it, um, which it's kind of interesting that it turns out to be the same number for both of them. But it turns out with the way physics of magnets works out, um, if you have a coil of wire and a magnet and you move them relative to each other, you'll get a voltage across the coil. If you take the coil of wire and run a current through it, you'll get a force between the two of them. The thing that makes a motor interesting is both of those are happening at the same time. So when, as you uh, make your motor go faster, you get a larger voltage across it, but you're also, however much current's going through it is how much torque you're getting at any point in time. Which is where we lead to fun graphs like this one that uh, motor manufacturers tend to publish, or for FRC motors, VEX also has a website where they've done testing of all the different kinds of motors and give you the graphs for them. Uh, there's some basic equations that result in these lines. Torque on the motor, torque is rotational force basically, so it's how much force your motor's making, is the stall torque times your current speed over the free speed, which the free speed is the speed the motor is going to spin at if you just put 12 volts across it and don't attach anything to the shaft. The current going through a motor at any given speed is the stall current times current speed over the free speed. Well, the stall current is the amount of current that will go through the motor if you grab the shaft really tight and don't let it move and put your 12 volt battery across it. Uh, the stall current is also your battery voltage divided by the resistance of the motor, which the resistance of the motor you can measure pretty easily with a multimeter. And if you do this math with the motor, you add actually works out where the stall current is the voltage divided by the resistance. Um, some interesting consequences of this is at the free speed, which is the maximum speed of the motor, there's no torque, which also means there's no current flowing through it. Um, at the, yeah, which is why, that's why it's the free speed of the motor is because past that point, it can't exert any force to keep accelerating, so it can't go any faster. Uh, that voltage across the motor is called the back EMF voltage. It's basically proportional to the speed of the motor. If you actually take a motor and a multimeter and stick the multimeter across it and have someone spin the motor, you will see a voltage if you get it spinning fast enough to notice anything. It's kind of a fun experiment to do. Uh, where that comes from is because as I take my motor here and I spin it, those magnets are moving past those coils, so you get a voltage out of them. Torque is proportional to current going through the motor, which is those coils producing magnetic field and against the magnets and that makes the motor want to spin. Um, in theory, you can measure that current with a multimeter too, although you probably don't want to do that because most multimeters and most motors, the multimeter can't measure anywhere near as much current as the motor will draw. So you will just end up uh, blowing the fuse in your multimeter. And that's why most multimeters don't have working fuses because people try stuff like that and then it doesn't work. Uh, Another interesting thing about controlling a motor is called current ripple, which you have some amount of current going into the motor at any given speed, right? And 
usually it's easiest to think of it as just being a constant amount of current. However, remember that half bridge, it only knows how to attach the motor to the battery and uh, both sides of the battery one way or the other, which means you're constantly switching back and forth. Motor controllers will typically do that switching at about 20 kilohertz. Uh, power supplies will do it at tens of megahertz, which is quite a bit faster. But uh, usually for whatever system you're using, a power supply or a motor, um, you're switching fast enough that the current doesn't change too much, which if you go do some calculus on what the current is going to look like when you attach given voltage across it, it's going to be an exponential decay. But typically, you're switching fast enough that you can just, uh, it looks mostly like triangles. If you look at really short segments of these exponential decay curves, they just look like triangles going up and down, kind of like the graph down here. Um, which, the fact that you're changing that current, and you're changing it pretty quickly too, like kilohertz is pretty fast, and megahertz is definitely fast. Um, you have rapidly varying magnetic fields because of that. So anytime you have current flowing through a wire, you get a magnetic field around it, which is basically what the coils in the motor are doing. Except outside the motor, you have wires with these rapidly varying magnetic fields. They go and take other electronics and do the reverse. This rapidly changing magnetic field results in rapidly changing currents in, say, your sensor or your RoboRio. And those are not designed to have external magnetic fields making stuff happen. So then you get problems with interference, and then sensors don't work so well. The other thing about that rapidly changing current is you magnetic fields store energy, is kind of what's going on when you charge up a magnetic field. You're physically putting energy into it, potential energy. And when you're changing that current, that means you're changing those magnetic fields quickly, so you're moving a lot of energy in and out of those magnetic fields. Which brings us to our next topic, those Rapidly changing currents do all kinds of fun things. Um, you get magnetic interference, and also the fact that you have wires going through them, even though they're not coils of wire, they're still physically wires, so they have inductance. So you can't actually change how much current you're drawing from the battery or whatever power supply you're using very quickly. Basically, over the course of the, one of those switching cycles, you're going to have a constant amount of current coming from the power supply even though the amount of current going to your motor is not constant. Which means you put a capacitor physically close to your half bridge and that helps uh, uh, reduce how much wire has quickly changing current in it. And because it's physically close, you also have less inductance, so you actually can change the amount of current quickly. Uh, for some of those kinds of circuits I talked about, it's actually on the output, so it's called an output capacitor, but it's basically worked out to the same thing. Uh, the fact that you have this large ripple current in the capacitors means that uh, the capacitors get hot. And if you look at a motor controller, like any FRC motor controller, and you see a big round can somewhere in it, possibly more than one. Those are the input capacitors. They physically have to be large because they produce heat. And if you make them larger, they end up producing less heat. Uh, basically, you have the energy that's constantly being moved in and out of them. This picture down here shows the two states of our half bridge. When we have the high side on, there's current flowing here out the inductor. So that's current coming out of the high side of the battery, which is the usual way you discharge your battery. Versus over here, we're drawing current out of the negative side of it. Which, the way electrical stuff works, positive current here is equivalent to the negative current here, pretty much, kind of. Um, the fact that you have two of these half bridges means that it's actually going through one and out the other. But um, this basically means that we're constantly charging and discharging this capacitor as you switch back and forth between the two configurations at your half bridge. And then this capacitor is constantly, you know, the voltage across it increases and decreases because it tries to oppose the change in voltage, but it can't do that completely. So the voltage across it changes a little bit and you're constantly moving energy in and out of those capacitors to charge and discharge your magnetic fields. Another fun thing about a motor controller is how you turn those MOSFETs on and off. Remember, the MOSFETs are those switches. Uh, usually you use what's called an N-channel MOSFET, which means that you have to uh, charge the gate, which is that terminal on the side that you use to turn it on and off. 
you have to put a higher voltage across that than the source, which is the bottom terminal in each MOSFET. Uh, there's also things called P-channel MOSFETs, where you bring the gate to a lower voltage than the high side of the MOSFET, but you usually don't use those in uh, motor controllers because the N-channel MOSFETs are more efficient, and when you're moving large amounts of power through something like a motor controller, being more efficient is helpful because you can make it smaller. For turning the low side MOSFET on and off, it's fairly straightforward because your input voltage is higher than the voltage you need to put across the gate, so you just put some of that across it and it's pretty standard power electronics voltage converter um, and you can turn it on and off. However, the high side MOSFET is a bit more exciting because you need a higher voltage than the high side of your battery, which typically you don't have anything higher voltage than the high side of your high side MOSFET. So you need to come up with some way to produce a higher voltage. The way you most commonly do that in things like a motor controller is called a bootstrap circuit, which is this capacitor and this diode here. This is a weird circuit diagram. When your low side one's on, this voltage here is gonna be ground. The high side of the capacitor is connected to the high side of the battery. So you're gonna put the full battery voltage across that capacitor. That capacitor is gonna charge up. Um, capacitor is going to charge up to approximately the voltage of your battery and then so once you do that right this here because that MOSFET's on so the load has you know zero volts or ground on that side of it uh, once we start turning that high side MOSFET on though so when we first start turning on it's pretty simple because the source of the MOSFET is at zero so we just have to raise the gate to something less than the battery voltage however once it starts to turn on then this voltage here rises up. And once it rises up to like the battery voltage, you still have to keep the MOSFET turned on. So, because you have that capacitor and that diode, when you start raising the voltage of the bottom side of the capacitor, the voltage of the top side raises up too. Normally, if you just connected it straight to that battery, that would force the capacitor to discharge. But it has this diode here. Remember, the diode acts like a check valve. It only lets current flow through it one direction. So once the top of the capacitor rises to a voltage above the voltage of the battery, that diode doesn't let it discharge, so it keeps, the voltage keeps rising until eventually as you have the high side MOSFET on, you have a voltage that's like twice your battery voltage across that capacitor. And that's a high enough voltage you can actually use it to turn the high side MOSFET on and keep it there. One of the consequences of this though is in theory if everything was perfect, then you could keep the high side MOSFET on forever with that capacitor. In reality, it doesn't actually work that way, so the capacitor slowly discharges. And as it discharges, eventually you will need to turn the high side off and the low side back on, even if only for a short period. So your motor controller can't actually stay on 100% of the time. Although typically it'll be like 99.9% .9 of the time, and for the most part, it doesn't really matter. Uh, last thing is how you control a half bridge, which is you have that half bridge, right? You can turn the high side on or off, but you've got to decide at any point in time, which one do I want to be turned on? The simplest way to do that is fixed frequency PWM, where basically you say every, uh, you know, hundredth of a second, I will turn the high side one on, and then sometime later, I will switch that back off and turn the low side one on. And how much of the time you keep the high side one versus the low side one turned on, determines basically how the voltage you're going to put across your motor, which kind of determines how fast it's going to go. There's also more complicated ways to do it where you like decide, okay, I'm going to wait, you know, two microseconds and then turn it off and then five microseconds, turn it back on. And the next time around, you might choose different numbers. Uh, but for most stuff, you just use the fixed frequency uh, pulse width modulation and it works. Uh, one thing to avoid being confused by is that term pulse width modulation. In an FRC motor controller, it gets used in two places. There's both on the output, where it's turning the motor on and off 20,000 times a second, and then there's the input, which is where it gets the control signal from your RoboRio, unless you're using CAN. Um, they're both a signal that turns on and off periodically, but the input one is every like five or 10 milliseconds, which is much slower than the output of the motor controller. But they're both PWM, and sometimes it can be easy to get confused between them.
Typically, you also use a control loop to vary the duty cycle that you're driving in that PWM. Um, usually, that, that outer control loop can be much slower. Like on FRC robots, you typically run at every 5 to 50 milliseconds kind of range. Uh, if it's a control loop, that means you need some form of feedback. If you're just driving a motor, it's common to measure current. Or for really simple motor controllers, you can also just vary the duty cycle and uh, when you, depending on what duty cycle you set it to, it's basically going to determine the voltage that you're putting across the motor. And uh, for some, some applications, it works pretty well to just use that and then rely on some external control loop to command whatever voltage you want to use. Uh, for DC-DC converters, which as I mentioned are basically the same thing, uh, where you're converting one voltage to another, you measure the output voltage and use that to determine what frequency or what duty cycle to switch at. Uh, but, in general, you use software to do that kind of stuff on a robot, and then you have lots and lots of choices for how to do it. And slides for this will be available, and here's some fun links if you want to learn a whole bunch about this stuff and how it works. Uh, yeah, there's lots, of, there's lots of stuff you can read online. These are a couple things I found that have a lot of information that's actually presented in a reasonable order and if you start on those and go through them and look stuff up when you don't understand it and you know on Wikipedia or whatever uh, until you do understand it then you learn a whole lot about motors and motor controllers. So if you want to know how your motor produces torque it's called the Lorenz force is the uh, part of it where when you run current through a coil and you got a magnet near you get a force between them. Um, the things are perpendicular to each other. Well, if they're perpendicular to each other, then you have force equals Q, which is, I forget what those letters all mean. Q times V times B. B is the magnetic field, I know that. Um, there's actually a cross product in there, uh, which is, you have two vectors. If they're perpendicular, the cross product is the same thing as multiplying them, basically. But if they're not, then you lose some of it which turns out it's sine of the angle between them with vectors. Um, so when you have your motor and your magnetic field, if your rotor and your magnetic field, when they're not perfectly perpendicular, um, some of the force from the magnetic field just pushes sideways against the motor bearings instead of actually wanting to spin the motor, which is not helpful. So typically you want to keep them as close to perpendicular as possible. With a brush motor, interesting thing is you have these discrete places where the magnetic field changes. So it can't always be perfectly perpendicular because that's not how the thing is physically put together. Uh, however, if you look at sine, sine has a flat part at 90 degrees, which is the interesting part here. Uh, it, even if you're like 30 degrees off of perfectly perpendicular, you still have like 90% as much force, which is kind of helpful when you're doing things like a brush motor because it means the torque doesn't vary too much as the motor spins. Uh, another way to look at this, at what goes on inside a motor, is think about conservation of energy. Where, to a first approximation, the electrical power in equals the mechanical power out. You also produce some heat, but when you're doing like first order approximations, you can ignore the heat being produced. The electrical power coming in is the current times voltage, and the uh, Faraday's law is. Uh, that's the electromotive force, also known as the voltage, equals the derivative of the flux linkage. So that, as it spins, the amount of magnetic flux from each coil, the amount of magnetic flux going through each coil changes as you spin it, and it's that change in it that gives you basically the same math if you work it out, which is boring and not very helpful. Um, controlling a three-phase motor. This is another exciting thing. Uh, three-phase motor, so your brush motor just said, like if you think of a really simple one, it's got that one coil that spins and you change which direction the magnetic field is and it keeps spinning. Uh, three-phase motor has to have at least three phases. Um, your basic idea with it is you have uh, three coils and the magnetic fields produced by current flowing through those three coils all combines to produce a single magnetic field and you can make that face any direction you want, 
but you typically want to keep it 90 degrees ahead of the direction the stator is facing so the stator keeps wanting to spin. Uh, three phases is the most common number, but permanent magnet synchronous motor is a general name for things with any number of phases. Uh, although two phases, you can't, it, get, it gets stuck in certain places, so it can't self-start, which sometimes for some machines and stuff that's helpful, but typically you want a motor that can start spinning all by itself. And then the reason you don't have more is um, three phases you get twice as much capacity to produce torque for only one and a half as much uh, copper in the coils. And for four, you'd get three times as much for twice as much wire. You know, it's two over three over two or four over three. And that same pattern continues as you add more and more phases, but the returns are kind of diminishing there where you only get it, pretty soon you start getting not very much more but despite that, if you want to add more phases, you got a bunch more wire and a bunch more control electronics and a bunch more stuff to deal with. So people usually stick with three. Another thing that I uh, would think people commonly do with the three phase motors is you'll look at them and they'll have like 12 uh, coils of wire on. That's basically you duplicate the three phases multiple times around the motor. You see we have the red phase and the orange phase and the green phase. And those are, there's four sets of them going around the motor. And it turns out doing that doesn't really change anything with the math of the motor. It just means that you, electrically, you have to switch stuff faster than three times per rotation. More stuff. Um, when you look at the flux linkage, which you remember is how much the magnetic flux from the magnets, which in your permanent magnet synchronous motor is in the rotor, and the stator has the coils. So it's how much of that magnetic flux, uh, how much how much, of, how much of the magnetic flux from the rotor goes through each of the coils at any given point in the motor's rotation. It basically, it forms a periodic function. And in general, you, that function can be an arbitrary shape, although there's a couple shapes that are simpler than others. One of them is a sine wave called the sinusoidal motor, or sinusoidal flux linkage. Um, torque ripple is where you have variations in the amount of torque coming out of the motor based on where it is in its rotation. Typically that's unhelpful because it vibrates stuff and wastes energy wiggling stuff around instead of actually moving the thing you want to move with the motor. Um, with sinusoidal flux linkage, if you drive sine waves of current through it, then you get a constant. Because this thing over here, sine squared of an angle plus sine squared angle plus 120 degrees or a third of a rotation, plus sine squared of that angle minus 120 degrees, it works out so it's a constant. Um, and this means you get constant mechanical power and also constant electrical power going through it, which helps reduce your current ripple, so it helps reduce how much work your input capacitors have to do. Uh, you can also do other stuff, but then they get complicated. Because um, if you want to avoid getting torque ripple, then you have to drive more complicated shape waveforms through it. The motor we're using for that electric go-kart has some of these complicated things. In particular, it has a fifth harmonic. So it's like sine of the angle plus half sine of five times the angle. It basically looks like two sine waves added together. Um, if you drive it with the whatever sine theta minus one half sine five theta, then you still end up with no torque ripple. Uh, if you multiply those out, then it comes out to two of those things, and then it ends up being still a constant. Uh, this over here is some actual data from one of our motor controllers driving our motor. And if you look at the big lines, you can see they look kind of like a sine wave, but with some extra squiggles in them. And this is as the motor speeds up really fast. Uh, the things get closer together. And then these other... The smaller lines are the voltages we're driving on the motors, and there's a little hard to see, but this isn't quite a sine wave, it has a little dip in the middle of it, because that's the uh, current being driven in that motor. Uh, if you have old motors and you take them apart, it's always kind of fun to see what they're made of. Sims are pretty easy to pull apart. Um, when it's fully put together, it's got this deal here it's on the front of it, basically holds stuff together. And then this thing on the back is where the brushes are. And then there's these two, two big long bolts that go through it and hold the whole thing together. If you pull those out, it just kind of comes apart really easily. 
and if you want, you can usually put them back together, but if, you, if you're going to put them back together, you have to be kind of careful how you take them apart to avoid breaking stuff. Yeah. Um, what kept you excited about uh, electronics and the mechanical, um, electrical mechanical systems? Started out doing FRC in high school. Uh, we needed a circuit board to power a little computer we were running on it, a coprocessor. And so that was the first circuit board I designed was a power regulator for that. Uh, after we did, you know, a couple other circuit boards for like mounting an encoder IC and a couple other things. And then eventually we uh, had our electric go-kart and we raced it and that was a bunch of fun. But then we decided we wanted to go faster. And um, we looked at what motor controllers were available and concluded that we could make one that was better. So we made one that was better. And after a couple iterations, it actually has turned out better. But uh, it took a lot of work to get there. But <laughs> learned a lot of fun stuff while I was doing it. Did you grow up here in the area? Uh, yes. I grew up here, went to Mountain View High School. And then I went to East Coast for school. But now I'm done with that. And uh, now I'm back. <laughs>